Hi everyone, it's the Catholic CEO, Henry Katarna. My special guest today in the Exemplary Catholic Leader Series is Adam Bartlett. He is the founder and CEO of Source and Summit. We're going to hear a lot about Adam and his work in a moment here. Uh, in the meantime, though, just take a quick look at the www.thecatholicceo.com website for some interesting information for your business and helpful daily emails from me on business topics that affect the Catholic business owner. And don't forget, we have a project that we're working on called The Catholic Economy. And so you can find that at thecatholiceconomy.com. And right now we've started a series of Catholic Business Expo featuring about eight or 10 different businesses each month. So take a look at that and I hope you find that interesting. But meanwhile, back to Adam Bartlett. So Adam, how are you doing today? Wonderful, Henry, how are you? Well, I'm doing well. I'm actually visiting my family in Texas. And so, uh, you know, even though my background suggests that I'm in the, in the Vatican someplace with my Vatican flag, I definitely am in Texas now and I'm enjoying my visit to the family. I'll be here for a couple of months. And uh, so I'm joining you in, in the U.S. So, so uh, that's what I'm up to. And so, Adam, you know, you and I have met before. I think we met in person one time at the Liturgical Institute some years ago. And so interested for our audience in what you do and in your faith journey. So maybe you could tell us, you know, a little summary of what you're doing these days, but also particularly, how did you get to this point? What's the faith journey of Adam Bartlett? Yeah, I was thinking back to that conversation, Henry, uh, I think it was several years ago at the Liturgical Institute. And I remember, I think, seeking your advice, you know, knowing your, your business background. I think that, you know, I could summarize my journey as someone who, you know, was given a very clear uh, vision and, and call, uh, vocation, if you will, uh, to help renew and advance the church's uh, liturgical and sacred music life. Uh, and I really dedicated my life to that. Um, I, I like to tell people that uh, I didn't know anything about business until I started one, you know, so it's been uh, 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 11 years I founded this organization. I was doing business as a luminary publication since 2011 and uh, rebranded and expanded as Source and Summit uh, just in uh, the end of 2019 and right before the pandemic. So, um, so really, I mean, my journey, I'm a, a lifelong liturgical musician. I, I was raised in sort of a typical suburban uh, American Catholic parish. Uh, my father dropped a guitar in my lap when I was a, a, a young lad and I was strumming the, you know, the folk mass uh, uh, music at my Catholic school from the third grade and kind of carried on, you know, in that vein for, for a long time. Uh, in my teen years and my high school years, I really became, I guess you could say, a subject of the new evangelization and really, you know, kind of made that transition from a, a nominally practicing cultural Catholic to uh, a, com a committed Catholic who, you know, who had, had encountered uh, the, the living God and, and you know, uh, really took ownership of my faith. So I, I, at that time, being a guitar player and so forth, I really got into the the kind of more modern contemporary sides of, of music uh, in the Catholic and sort of evangelical uh, worlds. And I went on to actually study music uh, in college more seriously. And really it was there that I encountered for the first time the richness of our Catholic sacred music tradition. So I was you know, discovering Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony and Palestrina and, and you know, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, uh, and really was, was, was floored by what I encountered. Um, also uh, took on the, the mentorship of my spiritual director at the time uh, as an undergraduate who was a U Ukrainian right priest mm -hmm. who was in residence at my, uh, and I think Henry, you might have a bit of a Ukrainian right connection if I remember that correctly. Well, there's uh, there, so uh, my daughter Alexis does have a lot of familiarity with that right. Generally, my tradition in the past, uh, actually 15, 20 years, is the uh, traditional Latin Mass uh, through the uh, uh, parishes that, that the FSSP runs. So that's kind of my tradition, but familiar a little bit with the Eastern Rites. And certainly my family, my daughter particularly, has a lot of connection with that. Right. I, yeah, I remember that with... Uh, yeah. 
um, you know, it was dur during this time actually that I, I think that I was catechized in the, the mm -hmm. theology of the liturgy really for, for the first time, uh, although from an Eastern perspective, uh, which was interesting. And I was recruited by this priest to direct a completely sung liturgy in English in, in the Byzantine rites. Uh, and I thought, okay, this sounds interesting. Uh, and, you know, his wife and his children and a few members of his parish um, were the choir at the Roman Rite Parish. And anyway, this was sort of my introduction to the sung liturgy for the first time. Um, yes. and, and I, you know, ha having lived, I think, with this kind of uh, uncomfortable tension uh, between uh, a music that, that had a very impact, a, bi a big impact on me from an evangelical and a devotional standpoint, mm -hmm. Uh, came to discover, you know, that, that my own rite, the Roman rite, had its own uh, sung liturgy tradition, and which, you know, you, I, I had no experience of that in a liturgical setting in, in my youth, but uh, absolutely fell in love with it. So I went on to study Gregorian chant, uh, sought out the mentorship of a Benedictine monk uh, here in the States, and studied under his direction for, for several years, went on to the liturgical institute and studied there. Yes, I uh, was a parish music director and cathedral music director in the latter years before I went on to the liturgical institute and joined their, their team as well for a little bit uh, and, and subsequently um, founded my own enterprise and started publishing the Lumen Christi Missal, Lumen Christi Hymnal uh, and Source and Summit, which uh, has a digital platform for parish um, uh, musicians and pastors. And also we have the Source and Summit Missal, which uh, we're getting out to hundreds of parishes actually um, already. This is, this is quite exciting too, and I, I've known this about you, that much of what we see in the pew, you could say these days, is uh, some of your products and, and some, of your, uh, some of your work. And so maybe uh, let's, let's talk about how, how did that happen? You're, you know, guitar playing, I understand that, and then you kind of have moved uh, traditional, uh, a little bit more into the, the, the historical treasury of the church, you could say rather than the contemporary uh, music side of things. What has brought you to that? And then tell us about these, uh, you've done these different missiles and different editions. Um, and that's all a development of trying, is this right, to get the, uh, the, the, the treasury of the church known to people more and the appreciation, the beauty and the truth of, of that kind of music. Is that, is that how it works? Yeah, I think that's all very true. And there's actually kind of a very specific path that, that I didn't highlight um, that has, has sort of put me on this trajectory. Um, I was always uh, very interested in composition and, and actually was doing composition and improvisation and so forth in, in music school and took a, took a very serious kind of uh, interest and applied myself to the craft of, of composition. Uh, my, my Benedictine uh, uh, mentor, had a, a very unique background in that he was concluding a doctorate in Gregorian musicology in Rome uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, sort of on the doorstep of the Second Vatican Council. And he really had the opportunity to, you know, to, to, to plummet the, the depths of the Latin Gregorian chant tradition, but also came back to the United States at a time when the vernacular was being I mean, thrust upon parishes, right, in, in yes. math. Mm -hmm. uh, and his key insight was that if we understand Gregorian chants rightly as a, uh, a, a, a wedding of Gregorian melody with Latin text, that is a hand and glove relationship, a melody that always serves and ennobles and brings out the, the, the you know, um, it never overpowers, but always serves the Latin text. If we understand that, we understand the way that the Gregorian chant tradition achieves that aim, we should be able to compose chant in this style that, that also serves vernacular languages. Yes. Now, that's what he actually began doing uh, in the decades following the council for probably 30 years, if not more, <laughs> that work was largely unknown because of course, everyone in the 1960s very quickly <laughs> forgot yes. about this tradition and wanted exactly. uh, one of the folk mass, et cetera. And th that's just a topic for another day. It's a, it's a mystery to, to many of us, but, but it, you know, uh, it was the sixties, right? So um, that's our explanation. 
<laughs> it was the 60s. It's no longer the 60s. But, you know, 30 years later, people like myself, young people started discovering this and saying, wait a second, I love Latin Gregorian chant, but could, could we achieve a similar effect uh, in our, you know, vernacular languages that we speak natively and so forth? So uh, I discovered his work and initially started to want to promote it, but then I also realized that it's incomplete. There's a lot of work to be done here. So he actually trained me in the craft of vernacular mm. chant, mm -hmm. uh, composition and adaptation and so forth, which is a, a very specific uh, art and, and, and craft. And he oversaw my work in the first, um, re I really cut my teeth with a book called Simple English Propers. And this was published mm -hmm. by the Church Music Association of America which really has been a kind of bastion of, you know, for lack of a better term, traditional liturgy and, and has been very uh, avid in the promotion of the extraordinary form, et cetera, in the U.S. and throughout the English speaking world. So Simple English Propers was acclaimed as the first complete collection of the propers of the mass, the entrance, offertory, and communion antiphons. Uh, again, in English, that are found in the editions the church publishes in Latin Gregorian chants. When you go to a sung Gregorian mass, the intro, right, ante uh, levavi anima meam, the first Sunday of Advent, uh, you would hear in simple English propers would be to you, I, uh, I lift up my soul, oh my God. Uh, so there was a, a, a desire to try to, in some ways, capture the, the, the spirit or, or provide an introduction, I think is sort of the, the way that you put it, uh, into this tradition for those uh, who, you know, for whom it would be difficult to sing in Latin and to, and to sing these very uh, elaborate Gregorian melodies. So they retain the same mode, they try to capture some, some of the essence you know, of that chant, but really to provide a singable repertoire for average parishes. So that effort really was a kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it was a gift to the church. I was paid very, very little for nine months of, of work. Um, it was just a, uh, an effort to try to spark uh, a, a recovery of the sung liturgy in, in the Roman Rite. But I realized almost immediately after the publication of, of Simple English Propers that it would not be enough. And that's when I set out, that's when I, I you know, took the plunge and uh, you know, quit my parish job and said, I, you know, found some, some angel investors and said, I, I have a vision. Let's, let's make this happen. We have to provide a complete uh, offering to parishes if we're going to supplant what they have, uh, what they receive from others like Oregon Catholic Press and GIA. They, they you know, it's a turnkey solution, everything on a golden platter. Uh, and, and I thought, you know, we have to do this, but we have to do it for, for the chanted mass and no, no, um, no resources uh, existed at, at that time and really still don't in many ways uh, to serve that need completely. And you know, the, the, the appeal of it, I mean, I, I can understand the sequence. If you go from the 60s to a time when uh, maybe more uh, mainstream, some call it conservative Catholic parishes where there's a tremendous uh, legacy of piety uh, in, the, in, in the new form, and gradually, what was, I think, thrust upon people or as an attempt to draw young people to the, to the church, to the, the, the music of the day was one attempt, I think, to draw people in. And I think, uh, I mean, I'm not going to put you on the spot with a debate on that one, but it, I suppose it's, it's not, it hasn't succeeded, one might say. And yet what you're doing, the beauty of what you're doing, the um, kind of typified by the movement from Latin language, Gregorian chant in all of its beauty and its elevating of the mind and heart to God, uh, to do that in the vernacular language, I think is a powerful step forward, but it's not being imposed. And your work is being actually gradually, I think, adopted across, well, certainly North America. I don't know about Europe, but Canada, United States, I know it's being adopted and, and brought to the case. Is that, is that how it's happening? Is it, is it a development here rather than a, an imposition? I think it's definitely a, a development. I, I think it is a, you know, a, a phenomenon in, in a way that reflects 
where the younger generations of Catholics uh, are, right? Because we have also the phenomenon of the, the millennial exodus, right? Like we're seeing yes. Uh, yes. all kinds of uh, uh, data. The data on belief in the real presence of the Eucharist is another powerful one. Yes. But I mean, the younger generations, the church is losing in, in, a, in, a, in a dramatic fashion. Um, now, I, I, there's some complexity here, but I, I, as I've lived this journey and as I study it and I work with other, other parishes and other Catholics that are, are, are making the journey, what I found is that it's very helpful actually to make some categorical distinctions between mm -hmm. different kinds of music that serve different parts of the church's life in different yet complementary ways. Like I told my own story, um, I, I know that there are many people who, who have come to love the liturgical tradition of the Roman Rite who have like a very charismatic background or maybe yes. are you know, a convert from a, a evangelical mm -hmm. uh, Protestant faith and so forth. Uh, really, I think that the music that often had appealed to us and, and assisted our our faith in the early phases, the church defines as the music of evangelization or the music of devotion, right? Yeah. And it serves a very different, it has a different character than sacred music because it serves a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it's very helpful for us rather than, um, you know, ever trying to denigrate or, or uh, to, to remove the, the existence of devotional and evangelical music from uh, the lives of Catholics or, or from our context. If, if we understand really what it is and the purpose that it serves, uh, we, we can affirm its value uh, in, in its own right. But, but then the church really invites us and, and encourages us to not let it supplant, but be directed toward a fuller and fruitful participation in the liturgy with all of its forms, with its music, right? And with its, mm -hmm. its, its tradition, its, its sacramental language that yeah. we have to learn. So I, I guess that um, there, are, there are generational differences in the church today. And I think that the revolution of the 60s and 70s and the, the, the music that uh, it was a revolutionary for uh, probably your generation, Henry, right? Um, I think that's right. Yep. High school, my high school days and early university days, that's when this was all happening. Yes. Right. Right. But also, I mean, the Beatles came to America. I sure. mean, like the, the you know, the, there was a, a larger cultural movement afoot. I think that the culture that we live in today is very different. So at a time when uh, a young culture, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s, said don't trust anyone over 30 and you know like out with the old and with the new we actually have an interesting phenomenon today where young people are saying um i i want to eat whole foods and drink craft beer and i want to do urban gardening and i and i'm discovering like a holistic lifestyle and, and there's a desire to recover many of the very good and beautiful and human things that our parents and the generations before us discarded. And I think that there's a similar phenomenon at work in the church and there's a rediscovery of the riches of the liturgy and of, of our sacred music tradition. And um, while there are devotional and evangelical uh, uh, aspects of the faith that, that serve their purpose and are really effective and powerful way. Like I work closely with a group called FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. They do powerful uh, uh, evangelization and missionary efforts on college campuses. But also they have new staff training and their, their conference liturgies also uh, have sacred music and, and the mass is chanted. So there's a distinction between what is properly evangelical, what is properly uh, belongs to the culture at large, which we are supposed to go out and, and Christify, yes, right? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. in, in also uh, times of devotion, devotional prayer, but then the liturgy is set apart so that it can become the goal, the source toward which uh, the, the summit toward which all things are directed and the source that invigorates our missionary discipleship and helps us transfigure the world with the light of Christ. Yeah, you, you've articulated very well. I think you've captured what 
uh, is being said and, and is being acted upon these days. You know, it's an anecdotal story, but you, you, you will know that during the past two years, during the pandemic times, uh, there are certain parishes in Canada and the United States that have more than doubled in size. And it isn't only the traditional um, Latin mass communities, there's some other ones where something has happened where people are drawn to it, they've discovered it perhaps from circumstances relating to the pandemic, let's say, when uh, maybe there are no other options or, or the mainstream options were closed to them and people discover these other things. And so I'm interested in what you say about the distinction between certain types of music like devotional evangelical versus, I'm not saying uh, exactly a hard nosed versus, but the, the worship, the, the liturgical side of things. This is an interesting phenomenon. To me, it seems that it's not being pushed or propelled by anybody. There's a natural organic thing at work here. Is that the case? Do you, do you see that? Because I know you're, 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 one might say you're a promoter of the beautiful uh, chant tradition in the vernacular. You're a promoter of that, I guess. But it's not being pushed by anybody. It's being naturally attracting, attractive to people. Would that be right? Is that the picture? I, I, I think so. I, I mean, um, beauty, a, a Thomistic uh, a definition of beauty is the splendor of the truth, the, the very mm -hmm. top splendor, uh, the, the, attract, the truth's attractive power. So, I mean, if uh, it, it could be a phenomenon, Henry, that um, we're in a, in a situation that is so deprived uh, of authentic beauty and, and we're surrounded by so much chaos and, and madness and, and ugliness. Um, I mean, turn on the news, right? I mean, just, just scroll through uh, uh, your, your Twitter feed and um, the situation in the world is not a pretty one. And, I, and certainly there are people who in the pandemic were experiencing uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, depression and uh, being locked yes. in their houses and, and uh, in desiring uh, something to transcend this, this very kind of stark mundane life that, that they're living and that, that we all live for, you know, over a year. And, uh, and, and where are they going to turn? Um, we have, you know, some beautiful historic churches resounding with beautiful sacred music and some kind of mysterious transcendent otherworldly uh, reality that they can step foot into and, and discover. Uh, and I think that it's in some ways, and I speak as a first year millennial, okay, I'm, I'm uh, just barely, barely have millennial status. But I think that, uh, you know, my generation uh, didn't have something that, that we rebelled against. We sort of inherited, I think, the, the, um, the rebellion of the 60s and 70s as our default. Yeah. And then we realized that, wait a second, there, 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 must, be, there must be more. We're, we're kind of reaping the effects. You know, we're, we're uh, in broken families and divorce statistics, et cetera, and, and abortion and all the things that have come about as a result of, of you know, the fruits uh, of, of a different time we've inherited and, and we've had to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, reckon with. And so I think that uh, we have the eyes to see the beauty that the church has to offer us in a very unique way. I think it's a phenomenon. John Paul II talk, talked about this in his uh, encyclical on the new evangelization, um, uh, Redentoris Misio. He said, you know, we believe that God's preparing, I always forget the exact quote, but you know, a humanity with the, the ability to be uh, evangelized in, in, uh, in a remarkable way. And I think this is a part of the phenomenon that he saw and that we're living through now. Yeah, and I, I can, that, that comment you made, that really resonates with me because I can see that there's been a legacy left from the, from let's call it the boomers. You know, they, left, they have left a legacy and, and in many ways it's not a pretty one. It's, it's, uh, it's problematic. And yet this response that you speak of, Adam, you know, people are, are responding to this and they're searching for the truth, beauty and goodness of, of art and, and design and architecture and music and, and uh, even in uh, discourse, you know, social discourse, there's a, there's a terrible kind of legacy. And, and I think people are looking for the good 
and, and trying to improve the good. And so I'd like to turn to a topic that's related to this. So, you know, you're, you're one of the leaders. I, 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 you're one of the pioneers. You're a person who's, who has now devoted your life really to uh, bringing this form of uh, beauty in the form of music back into the parishes. What's the story of how you do that? Is it, you know, publish books, publish hymnals and, and do courses? Or what's, what's the mechanism? Because people often respond to me anecdotally that it's complicated. It's complicated to sing chant. It's hard. It's not easy. It's, and it's, you know, not weird exactly, but some people say that. And some people say it's just, it's ancient and, and I don't get it. So what are your, you know, pedagogical methods, you might say, these days to bring this about? Yes. So really the task is twofold. Uh, and, and I've, I've, you know, at various times, I had tried to uh, address it from from both sides. Uh, one side is, as you say, is a task of training and formation, right? And, and in some ways, it's the fundamental task. We have to uh, understand the the meaning of the liturgy and the meaning of the rites and the structure of the rites and the that you know what you know what is sacred music and how does that you know et cetera the the, the kind of um, formative intellectual uh, uh, aspects. There's a significant need, and, and there's a need for mystagogical catechesis, et cetera, and, and, and this is really fundamental. But there's also another problem, in which, which is we need to have resources. We need to have practical tools and resources to, to make implementation and the practical elements of bringing a parish from point A to point B, you know, that those resources have to exist. And, and you know, to talk of, about one of the complications that's involved in the task for a, a parish music director or even a pastor, you know, who may have had uh, nominal liturgical formation and, and you know, largely doesn't have a, a lot of knowledge of these elements that we're talking about. Uh, you know, even just navigating the liturgical books correctly and the books of Gregorian chant and so forth, it can be a very complicated ordeal. And you have, you know, Latin editions and vernacular translations and different general instructions and so forth. And you're just trying to understand, you know, like, like, help me understand what it is that I'm supposed to do. So one of the ways that, uh, uh, that I and Source and Summit have tried to, uh, you know, make this task easier is with the development of our digital platform for parishes. Yes. This is a yes. subscription service that really is, is a number of, of different uh, resources and tools all in one. So firstly, it is a liturgy preparation tool. So uh, one of its unique uh, attributes is that it pulls all of these different elements, all the liturgical texts in multiple languages. You might hear my little guy in the background here. He's uh, uh, pretty, pretty. God bless your family, Adam. <laughs> um, you can hear his, uh, his voice in development here. It'd be a cool. Yes, exactly. Sure. Yeah, sure. The lesson is after this, after this interview, the lesson continues, right? <laughs> uh, you have, you know, all these antiphons and readings and propers and so forth. And, and uh, in the antiphons, you know, are to be sung to psalm verses. And there are different uh, psalm tones that can be used for melodies and all kinds of variability that can occur. Um, our application is sort of encoded, all of that. And then with one click, you can say, I pull up the first Sunday of Advent. I can see exactly what the church gives me. Um, if I would like to sing that in Latin Gregorian chant, I can pull it up and it renders immediately on the screen. Oh. I can, one click, I can, I can turn that into a, a modern notation rendering if mm -hmm. square notes are a little bit too, you know, uh, uh, out, of, out of reach for me. Uh, there are libraries of English settings of those same texts in different levels of complexity. Um, you can apply harmonizations and chord symbols and other things that might be needed on, on a practical uh, level. Um, the lectionary readings uh, are there. There are responsorial psalms for every day, a library of hymns. I think we have over 100 and 650 hymns, including the hymns of the Liturgy of the Hours uh, in the vernacular, which are the hymns of Ambrose and Gregory the Great, and you know, you have saints from every age. So really, we call it putting the, the riches of the liturgy, the riches of the musical tradition of the church at your fingertips uh, through this application. But then also you can uh, actually create the scores that you deliver to your musicians. You can, you can export and share a music packet. You can share a digital link, listen to audio recordings, um, et cetera. So it's really kind of the, 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 the 
the, the center of a music coordinator or music director's uh, daily and, and weekly work, this digital platform. Um, yeah, so that's, it's so that's a, a practical tool that, that I think is, is yeah. changing the game for a lot of parishes. Yeah, I just from the sound of it, and, and uh, you know, I, I want to dig into it a little bit more uh, in my own personal uh, life just to, to see more of what you've done. But really, then you, it's a powerful tool. And I was thinking as you spoke a minute ago, you know, the Liber Usualis, which is a, a famous, uh, you know, compilation, one might say, um, this is the contemporary version and more of the Liber Usualis, because you've got all the material in the same place, but you've got the background material, you've got the liturgical uh, component, the, the, so that one is, as one prepares to sing, let us say, um, one already knows what the liturgy is doing for that particular Sunday or that week or that feast. And so uh, this is powerful. Do you then see, I mean, if it works like a subscription model, I guess people could print it out, but literally um, people could then, if I understand this correctly, come to mass, come to a, um, to a feast day uh, worship with their device and then be able to do all of this throughout the mass really. And uh, so is it for the lay person in the pew as well as the choir and the, the school, well, let's say? So our, our digital product right now is actually a product for the for the for the parish office. So it's more of a ah, B to B to C, you know, kind of model. Yes, got it. Yes. Um, during the pandemic, we, you know, the, there was sort of this. Um, well, I mean, everyone jumped to live streaming masses and so forth. Yeah. But you know, yeah. pull, pull yeah. physical hymnals and missiles out of the pews. So we actually uh, spun up very quickly in our you know delivery of our minimum viable product a. a digitally kind of mobile optimized um uh ordo right or or, mm -hmm. or yes. you know, participation resource but that's something that you can uh the music coordinator or the pastor music director can prepare and share a unique link sometimes parishes put up a qr code and then you know people can can mm -hmm. access that on the device uh and that and that's great the the the, the um Verdict is still out on whether or not the church wants us to do this. I think that, you know, we have some technological technological changes in the church take, you know, a while. It took yes. us a while even to adopt the printing press and figure out what that was all about. Yes, yes, you know, yes. Figure out mm -hmm. whether or not that was a good thing. So I think inevitably in the future, there will be a way to sort of baptize devices so that they can be used in a sacred way. Right now, they're used for so many profane uses that there's, you know, this sort of a conflict there. Yeah. Um, but parishes also can create custom booklets, right, with, with this application mm -hmm. very easily. So uh, prepare a booklet with all, all of the, the readings and the content and the, the uh, chants and hymns that you need for a particular mass, uh, or even insert that in the bulletin, um, create scores for your, for your uh, musicians, et cetera. All of those capabilities were there. It's, uh, it's an interesting comment you make about the possibility of, quotes, baptizing devices, because you know, we see it all the time. People are in in uh, in church in the pew with their device, and they're following the mass or they're doing the readings and so on. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, anecdotally, I've seen it. Uh, then then they'll switch to text. You know, they'll check the texts or, or whatever. And so it's it's a it's a it's a complicated issue. And there's a little bit of the, as you say a conflict there. But it's continually then you're responding to the. The situation, uh, people shopped around a lot with live streaming masses. This could be, this could account for some of the growth of some of the various uh, types of liturgy. People shopped around and they could see this. It's, it was open to the public. And so they could check, you know, sure. what's going on at that Latin mass parish or what's going on at, at that uh, uh, Eastern uh, right church down the street. And, and it, I think, was an eye opener for people. And so I'm always fascinated by this business of responding versus, you know, marketing. So you're responding to a need, but at the same time, you're marketing, you're, you're trying, I, I think this is a fair comment, you're promoting this, is that right? You're, you're yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that there is a market, so to speak, that has emerged maybe in the last 20 years, I mean, maybe, maybe it was at work uh, for longer than that, but uh, th that we would say is, you know, kind of ready for, for what we have to offer. I, I don't think that every parish is ready for, you know, what we have to offer, at least in its current form, We're trying to find creative ways to meet, you know, as many parishes where that they are at as, as possible. Um, but that, you know, that, that's a challenge. But I, yeah, I would say that um, there's some, some things that are, that are happening organically, as you say, <clears throat> there's a, a growing realization that 
Um, there are elements of our, our Catholic and musical liturgical tradition that are worthy of being recovered. And I think people jump on Google and they start saying like, oh, how, how would I do this? What, you know, what kind mm -hmm. of resources are there available? And they, and they come to sourceandsummit.com and say, okay, I'll sign up for a free trial mm -hmm. and, and see what, what this is all about. So <clears throat> yeah, I think that we're, you know, doing um, the best that we can using, um, you know, the, the, the best marketing uh, techniques and so forth to make sure that people can discover and hear about yeah. Um, you know, the, this big idea and then give them an easy path to, to implement it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, as best as they can. So, you know, so I'm also uh, taken by the notion of a, you could say a generational shift that's going on. So as the, as the generation shifts to the millennials and you're there by one inch, I guess you just, your, your millennial card is still valid though. So it's, <laughs> it's still good, but you know, so a generation of, let us say choir leaders or um, church music uh, people is passing away. And what's going to happen next? Is, is what you're proposing the thing or is there going to be a, a different uh, approach? What, what do you see coming? Let's say, you know, in the next 10 years when the, when the generational shift is complete really and, and the boomers are very aged or, or have died and passed, uh, you know, to their reward. What's going to happen next? Well, I mean, we, we never really know, but I mean, my, my best uh, view of, of the future of the church, and you know, and other, other uh, uh, commentators that I trust and follow seem mm -hmm. to think that, you know, that we're heading into some difficult years and decades ahead. There's a, a dramatic uh, demographic kind of, um, you know, earthquake that's, that's about to yes. hit the church, uh, both in the priesthood and also in, in the pews. Um, I think that in a matter of less than 20 years, American parishes have uh, been reduced by about 2,000 from, I think, uh, 17, what was it? Actually, 19,000 down to 17 or almost under 17,000 yes. now. Yes. And that will continue. More to come. Yeah, more to come. Yeah, yeah, mergers. We were just in New England for a, a vacation and we went to a parish that has mass on Sunday evening once every two weeks and it's part of a seven parish cluster I mean it, there are different um, this is going to become more of a reality the younger pastors as the um, more populated uh, older generation is retiring they're going to be you know maybe the, the the only priest at a three or five or seven parish cluster right I mean the demands on on their time and energy are going to be extraordinary. They're going to have uh, limited funds. Um, I think that it's going to, uh, the, the, the evangelical mandate, the missionary mandate of the church is going to become much more focused. Yes. Uh, and we're going to be, you know, in many ways, just sort of taken back to a, a, a I mean, how would you say it? A, 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 Kind of mirroring the, the the apostolic age, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right there, there are books about this moving from sure. you know, Christendom to, to the to the apostolic um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, model, and so I, I think that we will have young, faithful, heroic missionary priests and young, faithful, heroic missionary Catholics. Uh, Ratzinger talked about a. Um, a smaller, more faithful, more purified yes. church. And that's probably a reality that we're going to be looking at in many ways. But how we move from there to, you know, to uh, a revitalization will, I guess, in some ways, depend on how well we evangelize, how well mm -hmm. um, we bring Christ into the culture. And, uh, you know, speaking from our perspective as a, a liturgical apostolate, the better that we celebrate the liturgy and more faithfully we celebrate the liturgy the more empowered uh we will be and in, in the more um you know uh invigorated we will be for uh the, the missionary work that lies ahead yeah. so the liturgy is not ancillary to this it's actually central it's the source from which all things flow and it's the summit toward which all things are directed yeah exactly and you know anecdotally we see even now uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the Western Canadian experience. Uh, half the Catholics have come back to mass attendance, half. Mm -hmm. and, and the funding, the money is about half as well. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's that's known. That's not a you know that's not secret information. I don't know where that trend will head, but I can understand what you've just said about a smaller, more faithful, um, as as Pope Benedict said, a smaller church where the um, the the there will be less room perhaps for you know experimentation because it'll be everybody will be reverting to cores core basics you know in in terms of life lifestyle and uh, fighting the culture you know the catholic ceo exists in many ways to help businesses actually become a force to resist the culture and so you know i can see that that's going to be imbuing the the mindset of a next generation of people probably and so the the search for uh, authentic liturgy that's truly uplifting and and raises the mind and heart to god and actually does it in the most beautiful possible way to me that's a trend that that could actually be coming and and probably will come which positions the kind of work you do you know very well for that and so which then so that's a long statement from my part but i'm what i'm leading to is how do you then how do you train the next generation I guess I'm coming back to this, you know, do you, do you set up a, a young children's, a children's choir, a youth choir at a parish? Do you train the, the old boys and girls, so to speak, to, uh, you know, to, to learn this new approach and to, and to get away from some of the more contemporary forms of uh, music in the church in the past 25, 50 years? Well, I, yes, I think that the, the training aspect is essential and, and we plan to make our contribution to that. Um, we've sort of prioritized the resourcing side, uh, but we have you know, the, the notion of the Source and Summit Academy as well mm-hmm. uh, with conferences and, and um, c- consulting for parishes and also uh, online resources, et cetera. Uh, there are other organizations that are, that are coming before that are, that are responding to that need as well. But I think, Henry, there's another reality that's at work here. And if you think back to, you know, the time that, that the folk mass was kind of, you know, coming in, into the fore, um, it was actually easily spread simply because the forms and the musical language were actually quite familiar, right? Exactly. So, Contemporary to that age, yes the culture so yeah. so you know if you could strum you could play a Pierre Paul and Mary song and strum a few songs you could probably play a uh you know what was his name Ray Rep or you know St. Louis Jesuits and so forth you, you know you you can do that it was familiar to you but what we can glean from this example is that there was a a cultural reality that was at play there and I think that on the flip side, the same thing can happen in our times with sacred music. And I'm not, not talking about, you know, the centers of ex- excellence, which are um, necessary and, and, you know, please let's have more, but you know, the centers of excellence that have uh, uh, the, the, the kind of classical English collegiate chapel, cathedral, choir schools, et cetera, like, please, yes, let's have more of those. But I'm talking about, you know, just, parishes where young uh, people and and maybe Catholic schools grow up chanting the mass simply. And and they're actually not, you know, they're experiencing the sung liturgy in a beautiful, accessible way, and it becomes normal for them. Yes. They actually actually don't need to go to college and and receive a four-year or master's or doctorate degree to become an effective liturgical singer that knows how to chant the mass you just have to be imbued with that culture. So I think that every every, every year and every decade that, that we move forward here, the more parishes that, that root themselves in the sung liturgy, the more Catholics are going to be formed in that culture and the more able they will be to participate in that in, in leadership. Um, so I think that that's a fundamental sort of cultural phenomenon that we need to um, foster more than anything. And then, of course, I, you know, I, there are some really exciting initiatives uh, kind of on, on the horizon as well that we may or may not be involved in directly uh, to train the next generation of leaders. And um, I, I hope that the next decade will see some flowering uh, of, of those kinds of initiatives. Well, I'm, I'm with you on that one, 100%. My bias is always towards, you know, get it done, get, let's do something, let's do something. So I'm, my bias is in that direction. And so I, I muse sometimes, you know, what if, what if we could create 
and get into all the parishes? What if we could get into at least the cathedral parishes of a diocese and begin this process? What will it take? And so my, my business mind goes to work and says, well, you know, we need to convince, uh, we need to understand what the market is for it. Well, the market may not be strong, but we need to convince some market, some thought leaders. Well, that means to me, possibly the, the pastors, the parish priests need to be convinced, or maybe it's liturgical councils and finance councils that need to be convinced, or, or maybe it's the, the um, creative music director that needs to be convinced. So I'm not looking for, you know, a specific how-to here from you, but it, it seems to me that those are the, if, the, if there's a barrier to entry into a marketplace, those are the three that come to my mind. And, you know, I'm not here to criticize them, uh, neither are you, but is that the barrier to this? Like, what, what's, the, what's the mechanism that's going to create an uh, adoption of this beautiful and, uh, you know, uh, this new trend, you could say a new trend in a certain yeah. way? Well, well, I think there's a lot of thought leadership that, that can continue to happen, um, there's a lot of vision casting that that can uh, that can be done, and, and we can do more of that. Um, mm -hmm. However, I, I also think that you know we, we talked about the the phenomenon that that is happening naturally. I mean, yes. I don't think that there's a priest under thirty five or forty or forty five really um, that is too excited about the liturgical music status quo in, in America, um, in Canada. I, uh, I think that, you know, we talked about this, this heroic persona, right? They're, they're the, the, you know, proverbial, uh, uh, you know, firemen running into the, the burning building, right? That, uh, in the, in the context of the church today, these are heroic young pastors that are innately, drawn to the riches that the church has to offer they they demand and they and they were they drawn to the authenticity of what the church has to offer and what christ has has shown them uh so i think that they they innately already know and understand their task i i think you know and, and i talk to pastors very often uh just had a, a kind of a very exciting conversation just yesterday with a young pastor who's in a, you know, a, a church building that was built sometime in the 1980s, and it's, you know, not very beautiful, and he sort of has inherited this, you know, music program that has been doing its thing for 20 or 30 years, and he says, you know, I, I want, I want to do what you're, you're uh, inviting me to do, but how do I do it, right, so mm -hmm. uh, we're mm -hmm. actually kind of exploring, like, a, a consulting model uh, to go in and provide some of that leadership, some of the expertise, uh, train some of their people, maybe help find them the right music director, give them the resources, uh, set them in motion, and then help guide them through the early phases. But this sort of, uh, I think that, you know, a lot of times a parish thinks that they need an expert with a doctorate, you know, and they're paying them, you know, close to six figures to, to get the job done and to, to provide this leadership. That's, that's un- reasonable for many you know smaller parishes yeah we I mean, may you know maybe the centers of excellence and cathedrals and basilicas and larger urban parishes can can do this uh, but really we need um models and resources that make it possible uh on this on the average parish level and that's what source and summit really is trying to uh to help bring about um so i think that you know like like this priest that i talked to yesterday i think that there are hundreds, if not thousands of priests across the country and across the English speaking world, just like him saying, I want to do it, but you have to tell me how. This is, you know, Adam, I, I, I can only agree 100% with you. I'm familiar with two seminaries in a more close way than most people are. So two, one in, well, both in the United States. Uh, and these two seminaries are, are creating heroic young priests. Like you said, they are. I can see it. And they're willing to do a lot of heroic things to recover truth, beauty, and goodness. And they may be, you know, hindered here and there. They may be blocked, but they're ready and they're not giving up on it. So I can see that happening. I think that's a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, pattern. And I also, I mean, the Catholic CEO, we, uh, I'm not sure how we will do this, but my, my pledge to you is that we will try to help in some way that we can, because this is an important mission as well. And I also think that your, um, the idea of, well, it's a, it's a long story, but I, 
I've developed something called Parish Management 101, which is an offering for priests in, uh, in parish management, because there's no time in seminary to train them for that. Philosophy, theology, and apostolates, there's no time. Unless they bring life skills in that area, they are thrust into parishes and they, they need help in administering and managing these, these big assets, huge capital plants, facilities. But the same thing goes with, with uh, chant or music. You know, is there a, a chant 101 thing that one could offer? I'm not looking for your next product line here, but it's it seems to me that starting at that simple level and showing people that it can be done, it's my simple, humble idea. But parish chant 101 or something like that is yeah. What about that? Is that yeah, I I think you're I think you're absolutely right, Henry. And I mean I, I packed my family up and moved them to uh, Mundelein, Illinois in the Archdiocese mm-hmm. of Chicago. Um several years ago and then father baron now bishop baron was uh, yes. kind of the height of his you know uh rectorship there and had just reformed the curriculum and it had restored actually since the first time since 1968 mm-hmm. a required three core sequence in liturgical chant for all seminarians yes, yes. so i actually designed and taught that for two years mm-hmm. uh and i think that it was i think it was really powerful i think that the the young the young guys really appreciated uh this and just like myself as as a young catholic who hadn't experienced this and you know kind of tradition and my own liturgical experience it's a, it's a time of discovery and of wonder and uh and you're also gaining skills and becoming competent uh at you know fulfilling that role as the the, you know, the chanting priest celebrant in the, in the mass uh, we need more of that, you know, and if, if yeah. hopefully every seminary does that, but um, there's also this kind of, you know, remedial opportunity as well. And I, I don't say that to denigrate the seminaries in any way, but no. No. I think that, you know, their task also is is significant, right? You, you have, um, I mean, as a millennial, I, 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 you know, can confess that I grew up in one of the uh, worst times for catechesis in the, in the history of the church, right? And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of back, um, backfilling that I've had to do and that, that my generation has sure. to do so sure um, so I think that yeah it was a huge opportunity and, and we'd love to yeah. to participate in that whatever way we can yeah yeah well here's uh, we're, we're coming to the natural end of our discussion today I know we, we, we there's so much more we could talk about and we, we will do this again uh, my second last question to you is what would you say to parents right now who are raising children and, and who want to expose their children to the truth, beauty, and goodness of the patrimony of the church, you know, all of these, these things? What, I mean, what would you say to the parents? What, what should they do about music and chant and liturgical music? I think there are a couple things. Um, I, I actually have a, a vision, Henry, that um, talking to these pastors that think they have to have a music director with a doctorate, you know, to, to have a, a program with chant and sacred music. Uh, you know, I try to tell them, you know, uh, look at your young families and, and mm-hmm. are they homeschooling. Can we get them a musical curriculum and start getting them to sing, you know, some chant? Can they become uh, cantors or a little scola at, at your parish, right? So I think the, 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 pa- the power that we have in these early formative years for our children is tremendous. Uh, my, my two daughters, um, my son isn't quite quite ready yet, but I have some older daughters mm-hmm. at a classical academy uh, here and, and they're just being immersed in, uh, thank God, you know, in, in the sacred music tradition, et cetera. Uh, but I think that our homeschooling curriculum uh, and, and efforts can also do the same thing. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, what if families began to sing the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office together in a very... Yes, way. this is a powerful point. Go for it. I like this. Yeah, yeah. You know, but what the more that we just kind of imbue ourselves with uh, the, the culture of the liturgy in its sung form, the more it becomes a part of us and the more that we can start to give that as a gift back to the church. Yeah, yeah, this is... Uh... These are these are excellent ideas, and I know that there are parents who constantly worry about such things, and I think you've You've given some some good advice here. So, so any Adam, as we come to the natural conclusion of our discussion today, you know maybe you should tell us uh, where where can we find you? Websites, your offerings these days. Do you have any events coming up? Things that you would like to tell our audience? We'll put these in the show notes as well. If you could email me all this information as well separately, we'll make sure it gets in the show notes accurately. But where do we find you? 
What are you offering these days? Any great events coming up that you might uh, want to tell us about? Yeah, well, you can find everything at sourceandsummit.com, www.sourceandsummit.com. Uh, and we didn't talk actually much about this, but we launched a brand new uh, annual missile last year, the Source and Summit missile. We're entering our second year uh, and have you know a few hundred parishes on board already uh, around the, the U.S. who have adopted this missile. It complements the Source and Summit digital platform, can be used in conjunction with it, or the digital platform can be used entirely on its own. So there are different uh, you know points of uh, of of, of uh, compatibility between the two, but the missile has, you know, uh, a chance for every every mass. The the proper chance uh, twelve mass settings in English, Latin, and Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, order of mass uh, in its sung form, lectionary readings, antiphons uh, that can be sung in a very simple way, also for uh, daily mass, and over four hundred hymns um, that are theologically reliable and and you know time tested, etc in English, Latin, and Spanish in a selection of devotion. So it's a, a very economical, uh, useful missile uh, as well. And you can sign up for a free 30-day trial for the digital platform online, request a sample copy of the missile, um, all at sourceandsummit.com. That's fantastic. That's that's just wonderful uh, news. And I, uh, you know, all I can say right now is thank you for being uh, part of this work with us today. And, you know, may God bless you and your family and all of your works, Adam. This is, this is great. And so well, thanks again for being with us. It is my pleasure, Henry. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to, great to chat as always. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. It's the Catholic CEO, Henry Katarna. Adam Bartlett, our guest today, very interesting. And I hope that you will enjoy listening to this again. And uh, we'll see you all next time. <laughs>